we're going to be talking a little bit more about the introduction where we left off last week and let's go back just a, a little bit did everybody work the test and get everything answered all right that, that wasn't very hard uh, let's review that a little bit what we studied last week, it said, should the book of Revelation be interpreted differently from all the other books of the Bible? Of course, the answer is no, because every book in the Bible should be interpreted the same. It should be interpreted, first of all, with prayer. Ask the Lord to reveal the truths to us. And if the uh, scripture isn't clear uh, within itself, we use other scriptures to clarify it. And number two, should the Bible be understood literally wherever possible? Yes, it should be. Everything in prophecy should be spiritualized. This is false because there are some things that are literal. We just take it like it says. The events occurring in Revelation are, are to be taken in consecutive order. One step follows another. Now, Brother Jerry, said, are not to be taken. On the an answer sheet, are, 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 are not to be taken. Okay, there, it has two blanks, are or are not. And you're supposed to. Okay, maybe I didn't make that clear, but there's two. You check one of them, either are or are not. And so. Are. So the answer is R. One event follows another. And no one can really understand the message in Revelation because God is keeping it a secret. Well, that's false because he wouldn't give it to us if he didn't want us to understand it. The book of Revelation is divided into three natural divisions. And which division makes up chapters 2 and 3? Um, the things... Uh, which are, which we will get into later, probably in about two weeks, which uh, the things which are uh, is the, the church or the seven churches. And the correct title of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the chief difference between history and prophecy is that history is written after events occur and prophecy beforehand. And if the interpretation of the symbols and revelation is not clear in the given passage, how then must it be interpreted with other scripture? Where did the book of Revelation originate? It originated in the mind of God. And John is credited, either John or John the beloved disciple, is uh, credited as being the author or the writer of the book. At number 9, 10, and 11, he pronounced a blessing on those that read, those that hear, and those that keep uh, the prophecy. And the angel who delivered the message to John was a man. The angel who delivered the message, uh, let's see. Have I got those written down in the life? The angel received it from Christ, okay. And Revelation is systematic and harmonious. The biggest natural division of the book is the things which shall be hereafter. And God gave the revelation to Christ. So really, that, that was pretty easy. We're just getting started. But we're going on a little bit farther, and I'm sure that everybody made 100%. This is self-achievement, and, um, and we'll even excuse those that that if it wasn't clear like sister miller and so you know this is self-achievement i'm not picking up papers and keep making report cards on this so it's just something that you can do for yourself but there's uh, one important rule starting on page five that throughout these lessons we'll give many scripture references to prove uh, certain points and to prove additional understanding so there there will be references given so be sure to uh, 
uh, look them all up. Not, not while we're studying, but sometime during this next week, it'd be good to study this and look up uh, the references. And so if we don't read them, then we may not understand what we're talking about. And so when we observe this rule, then we can eliminate some uh, theories and opinions that, uh, and find out what God really wants us to know. You know, it's amazing when you start studying this and studying other people's writings, how many different opinions you find concerning the revelation. There's, there are many. So we start with the salutation where John greeted the churches. You know, I still haven't gotten very far. I'm still on the fourth verse after this is the third week. And John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, Revelation 1, 4, and the first part of 5, talking about Jesus, said from him which is, which was, and which is to come, this refers to God the Father. As he gave this revelation to Jesus, uh, God the Father is a spirit, is infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, in whom all things have their source, support, and end. He's seen throughout the book, sitting on the throne. And I want you to underline that, sitting on the throne, and it may be helpful at the end of this lesson. For um, now we're talking about God the Father, and we find Him sitting on the throne, and He is the center of all action of the book, in their process and uh, reception and fulfillment said from him which is which was and which is to come and so when we uh, look at this John's uh, greeting he's talking about uh, and from the seven spirits now some interpreters have chosen seven titles of the Holy Spirit to be uh, uh, to be uh, seven different spirits but the names chosen here, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of Love, the Spirit of Holiness, the Spirit of Wisdom, the Spirit of Grace, the Spirit of Glory. Uh, but when we look at this, you know there are, are many more places in the Bible. If I can find it real quick, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I want you, if you want to, you can turn with me or I'll read it to you. But there's some more here that we could add to this. This is just some that people use trying to prove these are seven different spirits. But in chapter 11, talking about Jesus, the prophet prophesied concerning him, said, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There are also seven spirits uh, that are listed here. He's talking about wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. But what this really represents, you know, we can get into uh, trying to make things uh, fit what we want it to, what we want to believe sometimes, but there are other titles just as descriptive as the one that I read that we could use and say this is what he's talking about as being seven other spirits. But God, as I put here, that God hasn't authorized us to select any certain titles and declare that they are the ones that he meant. But this, what this really means is that the seven spirits are not seven different spirits but a complete administration to all churches by the Holy Ghost. Now, I just want, I put this in as kind of an inserted explanation that I hear a lot of controversy today that some people make fun of other people because they say Holy Spirit and others say Holy Ghost. 
But in the original Greek, in the original manuscripts, Holy Ghost was not there. It was Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost was added when King James uh, had the word translated. And so this is where it, it was translated Holy Ghost. And so in the original term, uh, the Holy Ghost was not there, It was, but the same word I said the Holy Spirit. So I just want to put that in as an explanation that I don't feel like we should condemn someone else because they say Holy Spirit. I've heard a lot of that in the past few years making fun of somebody else because they don't want to say Holy Ghost. They want to say Holy Spirit. But they're saying that, making fun of them because they're saying this, that they don't want to be... Uh, a part of those that say Holy Ghost. Uh, but nevertheless, Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, uh, it's clear that the word seven is symbolic and it denotes spiritual perfection and completeness as elsewhere in the Scripture. Throughout the Bible, seven is God's perfect number. It's a symbol of completeness. It's a symbol of uh, perfection. It's a symbol of holiness. And, and so this is uh, what we're talking about and there are several places in Revelation 4, 5, 5, 6 and if we wanted to look up references there's at least 20, 25 other places that where he's talking about this being a symbol of perfection God is perfect and we can start from the beginning that God uh, created this earth and uh, the seven days of creation six days he worked the seventh day he rests, and from there on through Revelation, we find that God, that uh, seven symbolizes perfection and the completeness of God. And then he said, from Jesus Christ, who is represented in a threefold way. First of all, as a faithful witness. This is referring to Jesus being faithful. The Bible tells us that he learned obedience to the Father, and he was a faithful witness. Uh, in his ministry on earth and teaching and preaching and healing and uh, as he, as a prophet and a witness of God in the last days and there's scriptures here to verify this and I've, I've read, looked up scriptures and you know I could go to some of these references and talk about them for a long time where he uh, prophesies concerning Jesus and and the names of Jesus and his coming but he is the faithful witness and then he tells us that he is the first begotten of the dead and uh, I, I was looked at one writer and it seemed like most of them want to change that and say that he's the first begotten from the dead but this says that he's the first begotten of the dead there could be a difference in uh, you look at words but this proves, as some people teach today, that Jesus couldn't have been uh, the first fruit of the resurrection because Moses and Elijah and, and the uh, Old Testament saints and all of these others that have gone on before. But even though that Moses and Elijah were translated, they did not receive their glorified body. Jesus was the first to receive his glorified body. And Moses and Elijah... And the other saints will not receive their glorified body until the end of this age and until after uh, all of these things have taken place and the uh, rapture of the saints when we'll be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. The last uh, verses in the 11th chapter of Hebrews tells us about all of these people who live by faith and were martyrs and they were destitute, they were naked, they didn't have food to eat, a place to live. And the Bible tells us they were sawn asunder, they were killed. But the Bible tells us that all of these died in faith, not having yet received the promises. God uh, not having something better for them, but God uh, having something for us also that we can join in with them. So none of the Old Testament saints or, the, or those that have died in Christ have reached perfection as of yet, but we will all receive it together when the Lord uh, catches away His saints. And then when we're changed, the Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first, then we which are alive and remain 
will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. The Bible tells us that we'll be changed in a moment in a, the twinkling of an eye. And so as Jesus is the first begotten of the dead, and uh, as the scriptures tell us, as it was proved that he was, uh, he died, that he rose again, and and he's also called the prince of the kings of the earth. The word prince is derived from a Greek word that means ruler. This doesn't mean actually, but in one sense that uh, Jesus uh, is a prince. But this prince, the word prince, derived from the Greek word, which means a ruler. And it's true in this passage in John 12 and 31 and Daniel 10, 13 and 20 and other uh, places that the word that prince is derived from means ruler. And that tells us that Jesus is ruler and at the end of this age that he will rule uh, this uh, world this, on this earth as king of kings, lord of lords. And and so this simply means that he was a uh, ruler. And then we go to the exaltation where he said unto him that loved us and washed us in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This scripture refers to the three marvelous benefits which are uh, principal and essential subjects of the Bible. And uh, they are these. First of all, He loved us. This is one of the greatest um, things in the Bible, the central theme of the whole Bible. We all refer to John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But did you ever think about it like this? God loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But Jesus loved the world so much that he gave his own life. And so it was a twofold uh, uh, there when Jesus died on the cross. God loved us and gave his son. Jesus loved us and gave his life. For he tells us that he loved us. And, uh, and he washed us in his blood. And uh, we can look through the Bible and we, we can see that all the way from... The Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and God came talking to them and asked them what they had done, why they had sinned. The Bible says He found them hiding and they covered themselves with fig leaves. But the Bible says that God made them clothes of animal skins. And so this would be the first shedding of bloods for the, for, for the covering of sin was when God would have had to have killed an animal and shed that blood and it became a covering for their sin and so the uh, blood is symbolical all through the Bible as an atonement for the Bible said without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin there are people today that are leaving blood out of songbooks they're leaving blood out of messages but without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin of course we know that Jesus became obedient to the cross he became sin on the cross and he shed his blood for the sins of the whole world and after this it says he made us and said he made us kings and priests unto God but let's look at this made us for a minute you know that we are we become a new creation in Jesus Christ the Bible said that all things are passed away and uh, the old things uh, become new and we become new cre uh, creatures in Jesus. Man in his natural state of sin is separated from God and cannot accept God's blessings. But after we're made new through Jesus Christ and through the blood atonement, then we become joint heirs with Him and we become kings and priests with Him and we shall own all things and we will administer the affairs of the universe when we reign with Jesus during the millennial reign which we will talk about a little bit later but the Bible tells us that we ourselves you and I all of us will reign as kings and priests with the Lord it's something to think about no uh, 
You know, we don't really realize this. We can't comprehend this. But uh, let me just uh, get away from uh, the text for a moment. But Jesus is coming. And the rapture of the church is going to take place. And we are going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there to receive the rewards for the deeds that we've done in this life. And while we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the uh, tribulation is going to take place uh, on this earth. But the Bible says that we will come back with Jesus and reign with Him as kings and priests. So this, uh, John was giving us a preview that uh, that we would reign with Him as kings and uh, and priests on this earth. He's made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. Now we worry sometimes about the judgment. Did you know that we are already judged when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior? Our sins are washed away. Our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. We become sanctified. We become cleansed. We become a part of the glorious church that he talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. Then it, it doesn't seem right then that we should go to a judgment to see if we're right with God or not. And so our judgment takes place uh, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. But the only judgment that we will attend to be judged will be when they hand out the rewards while we're with Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb while the uh, uh, tribulation is taking place on this earth. And so we'll get into that a little bit deeper and a little bit uh, more uh, in depth a little bit later on. So... The next, it says the theme of Revelation. I've talked about this and explained a little bit last week that the theme of Revelation is simply the coming of the Lord. You know, we talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of people that misunderstand this. They don't realize the difference between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus. The rapture will be when Jesus appears in the clouds. He will not step foot on this earth. But we as Christians, the Christians that are in the graves, the graves will open, and about the time they get up to the level that we're on, we'll just join in with them. For the Bible said that we shall not precede them. Or it says prevent, which means proceed, or we will not go before those that sleep, but we will go together. We will meet Jesus in the air. And then we will go to what we've been talking about, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is not the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is the rapture of the church. The second coming of Jesus Christ will not take place until seven years later or at the end of the tribulation period or the end of Daniel's 70th week, which uh, I plan to talk about next week. I, I'm going to just take time out and just talk about Daniel's 70th week and we'll go in into that next week and so the theme of Revelation is the coming the second coming of Jesus this is when he will do uh, you know the, the reason for Daniel's 70th week is that God will deal with Israel as a nation once again and this time Jesus will win they will accept him as the Messiah at the end of this week. But I won't get into that tonight. But the theme of Revelation is, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth, shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1 and 7. This refers to the second coming of Christ, which is the chief theme of the book, the important events that occur in and between uh, the seals, vials, and trumpets, they're all in, in a part of God's plan, uh, preparing Christ's second coming. And it's announced in the beginning, it's announced in the middle, and at the end of the prophecy that Jesus is coming. His second coming is referred to many times in the book of Revelation. 
and is vividly described in Revelation 19, 11, and 21. And it said, every eye shall see him. I think a lot of people have misunderstood this. They're looking for a time when Jesus will just appear in the air somewhere and everybody in the whole world will see him. This, this isn't true. When Jesus comes to get his saints, uh, there will be people that won't know what happened. They'll look around and they'll wonder what happened to the Christians. There will be people come to church, think they're good church members. There will be pastors open the doors to have church. There will be deacons, teachers, and uh, people that were not ready to meet the Lord left behind. I sincerely believe this. If you're not ready to go, He won't take you. And contrary to what some people teach, I had one man tell me, uh, because of his belief that uh, he said when the Lord comes he said I'll go regardless he said it doesn't make any difference he said I'm sealed and it doesn't make any difference what I do when the Lord comes I'll go he said it doesn't matter if I'm sitting on a bar stool drunk he said it doesn't matter if I'm in bed with somebody else's wife he says I'm saved and I'm sealed unto the day of redemption and he said, I will go regardless. I don't believe that. The Bible teaches me that no unclean thing will enter into heaven. And the Bible te teaches me that we must be cleansed, that we must be separated, set apart uh, for unto God, and we must put aside the things of this world, and we can't have sin in our life and go with Jesus when he comes. And I'm afraid that too many people are just uh, borderline. You know, they they want to be saved, they want to live for God, but they want to be in the world also. So they're just pulled between. They just can't really make a total commitment to Jesus Christ. And this what it what it really takes to be ready to go when Jesus comes is a total commitment, completely sold out to God 100%. This is what we're talking about. And it would be terrible to be left behind. I have people, I have friends tell me that Jesus cannot come today because there are certain scriptures that need to be fulfilled. And I have friends that try to tell me that the church will go through the entire tribulation and uh, other theories. But for some reason, I, I tend to believe that the Bible says to pray that you would be accounted worthy to escape the things coming on this earth. And I believe that it is possible to live for God, to be close to God, to be ready when Jesus appears in the air, and that we can go be with Him while God is pouring out His wrath on this earth. And I sincerely believe that, and it can be proved by Scripture. And But where He said, Every eye shall see Him, this talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, which I just explained would be at the end of this uh, seven year. This would mean all of the eyes in the immediate vicinity of Jerusalem where Jesus lands. The Bible tells us that Jesus, I believe it's in uh, let's see, Zechariah, I believe tells us where he's going to land on Mount Olives and the, the mountain will uh, break in two on the east side of Jerusalem and the valley will be formed but it says that every eye shall see him and this would mean those that are in the immediate vicinity of Jerusalem where he lands for it's clear in Isaiah and Zechariah that people in distant countries will not see him until later that is in person and so what I'm talking about is when Jesus comes back to Mount Olives, those in that area will see him with the natural eye, but it will affect the entire world around the world, and people on the in other countries around the world will see him, but it will probably be by way of a satellite. The way uh, things are today, that just immediately within split seconds, they could have Jesus uh, all televised and people around the world could see him and it's going to to uh, affect people the entire world over when Jesus returns uh, technology has increased 
uh, tremendously in the last 50 years. And if the Lord tarries another 50 years, I wonder just what we can really expect. You know, they, they do great things electronically. And But here the word see, it says every eye shall see him. The word see isn't like I could stand here and say, well, I see you or you see me. This word comes from a different meaning, which means to look upon, but uh, not one to look upon, but it means to gaze or stare at with wide open eyes as it's something remarkable, something absolutely horrifying to the beholder producing fear, hatred, or reverence as the case may be. And there will be those that look on him with reverence. There will be those that look on him with fear. And there will be those that look on him because of hatred when he returns. And it says, they also which pierced him. And this refers to the nation which pierced him or the descendants of those which pierced him. He's probably referring to the Jewish nation. Of course, we know that the Roman soldiers were actually the ones that pierced his side. But Jesus was there not because the Roman uh, empire, the Roman soldiers, or the Roman ruler wanted him there, but it was because of the Jews, of, of the nation of Israel, wanted Jesus crucified, but they wanted the Romans to do it for them. And, and throughout the Bible, you'll find in many places where even at the beginning of the church, when they stood and preached the gospel to the Jews, they pointed a finger at them and said, He is the one that you crucified. And they never, not another place, uh, do they blame the Romans for crucifying Jesus, but always the blame is laid on the Jews. And it says, They also which pierced him. And of course, you know, possibly the Romans have paid, or they will pay, for taking part in it. I feel like they probably have already paid for taking part in it. And uh, because they were both guilty of piercing him, both will be pressed in a second coming. Uh, but it couldn't possibly mean the actual people that held the spear and pierced his side. And two reasons, because if any of those who took part in the crucifixion were converted and got saved, then they will have been raptured with the saints. It is possible that some of those that took place, that, you know, this young centurion uh, stood back and, and made the great statement that's been quoted many times when he said, surely this was the Son of God. He could have been converted. And if he was, then he would have been raptured with the saints at the beginning of the tribulation. And uh, even if they weren't converted, then those who were not saved died in sin, and they're waiting in hell where they will remain until 1,000 years after Christ's second coming. Uh, then they'll be resurrected with their bodies and judged before the great white throne and cast into the lake of fire. And so we'll, we'll talk more about that a little farther down the road. And so when we talk about the eternity of the Son of God, I noticed in the bulletin I put uh, the eternity of God, I believe, and but it's supposed to have been the eternity of the Son of God, which says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. And the first letter in the Greek alphabet, all of us know this, I'm sure, the first letter is Alpha, the last letter is Omega. And this verse simply refers to the eternity or the uh, omnipotence of Christ. That means that Jesus is our all in all. He's everything. He, and I used to use this and preach that Jesus is everything from A to Z. In our alphabet, A to Z. In the, the, uh, the Greek alphabet, Alpha, Omega. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And this is simply talking about the omnipotence of Christ. He is all power. He is all present. He is, he is everything. So all power is given unto Him of things in heaven and things in earth, things beneath the earth. And so Jesus just referred to Himself as Alpha and Omega, the beginning and ending, 
Jesus was saying that I was there in the beginning. For in one place he said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He was there in the beginning. And he will be there at the final, the grand finale. Uh, when the final wind up takes place, Jesus will be there. And throughout eternity. So let's talk about John. The prophet John. John says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion, uh, companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And uh, I spoke a little bit about this a week or so ago, where early church tradition tells us that John was boiled in oil, and when this had no effect on him, I believe that things happen. If you've read some of the accounts of the early Christians, some of the tragedies that happened to them, how that some stood in the fire, some faced firing squads, some had uh, cruel torture, and things that happened to them. We could even go back to the three Hebrew children, how they walked in the midst of the burning fiery furnace, and their hair was not singed. And when they came out, they didn't even have the smell of smoke about them. But uh, it is possible that they could have boiled him in oil. And, uh, and when this didn't work, they banished him on the Isle of Patmos. The Isle of Patmos is a small barren island which is made up of volcanic ashes. And there are no trees. It's just a place six miles wide, ten miles long where they banished criminals and just to do away with them but tradition tells us that boiling and oil had no effect on John so they just put him on the Isle of Patmos and left him well I don't know about that we know the Bible doesn't tell us uh, these things that's tradition but there is one thing that we do know we do know that he was there on the Isle of Patmos we can believe that we know that he was there and we do know that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day because he told us so, and we can believe that. And we know that he did receive a mighty revelation uh, which resulted in the explaining of the mysteries of God which have been kept secret from the beginning. This tells me that there were some things that God didn't want us to know until it was time for us to know it. And so he revealed it to John and uh, that he might give it to us that we might have it today. So we'll go to part two, the first natural division of the book. As I said last week, there are three natural divisions that we find in chapter one, verse 19, where he told him to write the things of which thou hast seen, write the things which are, and to write the things which shall be hereafter. The three things they told him to write and he says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the, of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now you might underline this also. He was clothed about the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white like wool. You might underline that as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, you might underline that. And his feet like unto fine brass, you underline that. And the reason I'm saying that, because they're on the, the question sheet, it might make it a little bit easier to come back and find the answers. And it says, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. This also is something to remember. And he had in his right hand seven stars, as a matter of fact, this, this entire uh, scripture looks important. I think it's pretty well covered uh, in the question sheet. And it said that 
He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. We begin now to find some symbolism. As we said that there are signs and symbols throughout the book of Revelation. And But uh, one thing let's avoid while we're studying this book is to try to symbolize something that we can understand. There are people that try to symbolize everything. Try to make something uh, out of uh, something that we can understand as it is written. The only symbolism in this vision is that of the candlesticks, the stars, and the sword. The remainder is simply a description of what John saw, the glorified Christ, the way he now looks since his ascension to the right hand of God. John, probably to the best of his ability, tried to describe what Jesus looked like. And I'm sure that it wasn't easy. And so this is what uh, we're talking about. He was clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So we have no reason to believe, as some do, that Christ's clothing, voice, countenance, eyes, etc. are symbolical. But instead, it's reasonable that this would be a good description of the glorified Son of God who dwells in the very presence and fullness of God. And in understanding the Bible, we should never symbolize anything that we can understand. But uh, concerning the sword, it's not reasonable to think that Jesus walks around with a sword in his hand all the time also. So this must be symbolical. And when we go back to the scriptures, we, we uh, see that the sword is the word of God. The Bible tells us that very plainly. And, uh, or... Uh, a sword protruding from his mouth which symbolizes the spoken word the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God and in this armor he talks about the word of God that putting having the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and when we speak the word of God this is the sword of the spirit which uh, is symbolical here protruding from Jesus mouth or it said he stands in the midst of seven golden candlesticks or holds in his hand seven literal stars. These symbols have a greater meaning, a greater meaning which we will go into. Uh, of course, it said his head and his hair were white like wool and uh, as white as snow. This is we can see in Daniel 17 and 19 also. His eyes were as a flame of fire penetrating that to me, that means that Jesus is all-seeing, that he knows all things. And when uh, Peter was in Pilate's judgment hall, he looked across and saw Jesus looking at him. I believe that he met with the, that flame of fire because he was pricked in his heart and the cock began to crow and he went out and wept bitterly. And his voice was as the sound of many waters. He was simply trying to describe how that, he's, how that Jesus sound when he spoke to him. And there are people even today that have had uh, spiritual revelations, experiences where Christ has spoken to them and it is as a sound of many waters. And his feet, well there's one writer that said, well because John was surrounded by water on the Isle of Patmos that this was all that he could hear was the sea roaring. I don't believe that. I believe that he heard the voice of Christ and it was as a sound of many waters. His feet was like, were like unto fine brass as if burned in a, a furnace. We know that the Bible tells us that every man's works will be tried by fire. And the works and those that, that remain, there will be some remain, but there will be some, the wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up. And uh, But to me, uh, this means purification that's burned or purified by fire. And he had in his right hand seven stars. But I'm not trying to symbolize this. I'm just saying that 
A fire represents purification, but this is what John saw. His feet looked like fine brass as it had been tried or burned in a furnace. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now this is symbolic, and it represents Christ upholding the church. I believe that Christ is still upholding the church. He's still walking in our midst. He's still with us because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but I will go with you even to the end of the world. And the Bible said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst also. Isn't it great to know that just two or three of us can get together and talk about the Lord and Jesus is right there with us? And I've had opportunity this week to talk about the Lord with people of other denominations. But, you know, you find people that really love the Lord that go to other churches. And you can just talk about how good God is. And a man shared with me how that God met his need. How that...